Welcome uh, to the second webinar in our CCC RSI webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. We are thrilled to welcome Silvana Chavez, uh, a, a very expert presenter. I'll be talking more about her uh, in just a moment. Uh, just as a matter of quick housekeeping, um, I am Marjorie Bancroft, uh, your host and the founder and director of Cross-Cultural Communications, also known as CCC. Uh, we are the only national training agency for medical and community interpreting. Um, I'm delighted, by the way, to uh, and to show Silvana, who is attending. Please note, let me see if I can make this can't make it bigger, but scroll down to the bottom. Oh, you are excellent. You are filling out all the options. Um, we are hosting this series because of COVID. The coronavirus has made remote simultaneous interpreting or RSI an absolute necessity. Uh, please know, however, that if you are looking for certificates, only those who attend the live webinar, not the recorded version, uh, will be able to get CUs for ATA and CCHI. Uh, CUs, we did apply for NBCMI, uh, but the last I heard, we had not heard back. Um, if you would be kind enough, please use Q&A to write your questions for the presenter. We never get to all to answer all the questions that we, uh, Silvana will do her best to leave uh, some room at the end for, for, um, for answering. If you have questions for us at CCC, questions about CUs or anything to do with CCC, please use chat. Or if you just want to uh, make general comments, please use chat. So, Thanks so much again for attending um, this in this series. There are two more in the RSI series, one in two weeks that's on legal interpreting and another one that is on community and educational interpreting two weeks after that on June 10th. Um, we will be also answering questions after our presenter leaves about CCC and our Blue Horizon online training or CUs or anything else for those of you who have questions after the webinar. Uh, but for now, I would like to uh, briefly introduce our amazing presenter, Silvana, who is based in Spain um, and, and originally from Argentina, is a 27-year veteran of, of conference interpreting uh, English, Italian, Spanish, and a translator. Uh, cute little fact, she has taught at the same conference interpreting uh, master's program at Cluny in Madrid, where our managing director did her master's in conference interpreting. Isn't that fun? Okay. The last two years, she has been so totally immersed in RSI. She has investigated numerous platforms. She has a lot of expertise to share with you. We are really honored and thrilled to have her here. Without further ado, I am going to uh, turn over uh, the baton to Silvana, and I will also make her the your host right now. The rest of the webinar. Oh, uh, before I do, um, uh, Silvana, I'm going to end yes. the poll so, and share the results briefly, just so that everybody can see okay, who's here. So it is a third conference inter interpreters, just over a third legal, half of you are medical, 70% uh, do business interpreting, almost 30% do community, um, and a few do refugee. Uh, we even do have 5% of you are interpreter coordinators. Uh, fewer government linguists. So this has been fascinating. I'm going to stop sharing now, make you the host. Hold on. Um, have fun, Silvana. Enjoy our okay. audience. Well, good morning for those of you in the United States and good afternoon and good evening for those of you who may be connected from Europe or Asia. Welcome to this webinar on RSI and thank you for joining. First off, let me thank Marjorie and all of her team across cultural communications for having organized this series of webinars and for having me. I'm really delighted to be here, Marjorie. Also, I would like to thank my colleague Katie Kaufman who opened this series of webinars uh, two weeks ago and whose insightful presentation is the perfect introduction to this webinar. As you know webinars of this kind usually gather a very assorted audience therefore I have decided to walk you through RSI 
by uh, answering five key questions, which I hope we shed some light on the topic. This webinar is mainly intended to those of you who may be currently involved in some kind of interpreting practice, uh, such as medical interpreting or um, community interpreting, and who may be keen on expanding your professional scope. So, let us start. Okay. I said that we have five key questions that I would like to uh, answer through this presentation. And you will have to bear with me because there's plenty of uh, technology embedded into this presentation, but the purpose was to give you uh, the real gist of RSI. So RSI, a new environment for a different world. Before I try to answer those five key questions, I would like to review some concepts with you. What is interpreting? Well, interpreting is the process of communication that entails coding and decoding information. Now, simultaneous interpreting is the process of coding and decoding information in real time. I like defining conference interpreting or simultaneous interpreting rather as the art of solving the unexpected in the field of communication. Why an art? Well, because the conference interpreter has to deconstruct a message into all of its components components in a source language and then bring all those pieces back together in the target language. So somehow this is a recreation process that uh, requires a certain um, set of skills as well as a high degree of intuition and sensitivity in order to be able to anticipate the final output. Now, according to AIC, the International Association of Confidence Interpreters that Caddy described two weeks ago, uh, an interpreter needs to have a good level of general education, a lively and flexible intellect, analytic capacity, the ability to put themselves in the minds of the people for whom they are interpreting, and they also need to have a strong mind. They need to be able to concentrate, have a good memory, have a pleasant voice and good diction, and be physically and mentally robust. In summary, a confidence interpreter or an interpreter in general needs to have a complete mastery of their working languages. This means a well-developed capacity to express themselves in their native language and a good grasp of their passive languages. And this leads us to the first question. What skill set do I need to go with RSI successfully? I'm going to narrow down the answer to this question to RSI services over RSI platforms. Afterwards, I will speak about hubs as well. So in answering this question, an interpreter would need all the skills that you see listed on the left, plus, an extra dose of good fatigue and stress management. In fact, some uh, studies conducted lately have shown that distance interpreting increases the cognitive load of the interpreter by 25 to 35%. That means that in an RSI situation, we are likely to have to switch turns every 15 to 20 minutes rather than 35 to 40 minutes, as it is usually the case in confidence interpreting. Plus, in RSI, we have to juggle a lot more balls. Why is it so? Well, because we have to do our regular interpreting delivery, plus we have to cope with the challenge of distance interpreting. Uh, the fact of not being there means that there's a lot of information that you normally gather when you are on site, the conference venue, that in RSI you will just have to figure out. Plus, we have to control all technical variables. In the case of RSI platforms, there are multiple functions that you will have to learn to control. Plus, we have to work without the usual support of a booth mate. 
You know that confidence interpreting is about teamwork. In other side, you might work with a partner, but he will not be co-located. That means that whereas in a booth situation, asking for help is a natural intuitive act because by just looking at you or by the tone of your voice, your partner knows exactly when to jump in for assistance. In the case of RSI, you would have to send a chat, to your partner or a WhatsApp asking for help. So what in a booth situation is an easy task, in the case of an other site platform, this can become quite a hassle. Okay, I know that many of you would uh, like to learn about the technical requirements that you would need to meet in order to provide other site services from home. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on this because actually you can find this information on the websites of the different other site platform uh, vendors available. However, this is a list of the guidelines you should follow. And once you have all these in place, don't worry because you will have this presentation afterwards. But again, remember that once you have all these in place, Keep calm and carry on. Okay, what about the headsets that meet requirements for interpreters or, or participants? Well, AIC uh, usually conducts several studies on these matters. Of course, AIC does not endorse any particular manufacturer. However, here you can have some recommendations you could follow. In my personal opinion, Sennheiser is one of the best uh, brands for interpreters. This is a German brand and they specialize in engineering equipment mainly targeted at interpreters. In fact, I'm using a Sennheiser headset right now. Okay, and this leads us to the second question that was included in the invitation to this webinar. Why confidence interpreters have an edge in RSI? Well, because confidence interpreters have the expertise, and by expertise we mean the set of technical skills plus the knowledge derived from extensive experience in a given field. Plus, apart from the expertise, Confidence interpreters also have between language control. I would say that the extreme situation um, of between language control is simultaneous interpreting because in fact, the interpreter receives a spoken message in a source language that he or she has to reformulate and produce into a target language. So in this process, two language systems are activated simultaneously. One for comprehension, that is the source language system, and another one for production, that is the target language system. In order to perform this task effectively, the interpreter would have to exert plenty of executive control. That is, strong coordination will be required in handling both active systems in order to avoid any information loss or any interference. Of course, as interpreters acquire more experience, resource allocation becomes more effective. And finally, confidence interpreters have metalinguistic awareness. This is the metalinguistic ability to go beyond implied meanings in order to understand um, Phonemes, syntax, uh, wordplay, sarcasm, irony, etc. It's the fact of being aware that language has a flexible structure that can be manipulated and exerting cognitive control in doing so. Okay, also. Uh, confidence interpreters have an edge when performing other side services because they have been exposed to all kinds of situations. For example, they know about the dynamics of meetings, how to anticipate conflict. They also know how to solve unexpected situations with poise. And they also know how to deal with overcrowded audiences. I'm sure that this is a picture that you may have a come across lately, those of you who have some experience performing uh, RSI. This is a typical Zoom meeting. In this case, 
we may have multiple people speaking at the same time. However, the interpreter would have to make a distinction between each speaker, making sure that all the messages are translated and by making the right pauses and using the right intonation. Why confidence interpreters can do this with certain expertise? Well, because in a confidence situation, usually we are exposed to many presenters who speak very fast or just read out their presentations and we have to speed up our own delivery. Well, um, we have to do so, however, with the right tone and intonation in order to render an intelligible message and not just a compact string of words. And finally, conference interpreters also have a good grasp of body language. In other side, um, grasping body language may become a challenge if you get a blurred um, image or a poor video feed. However, a conference interpreter can elicit meaning by associating a particular situation with another one that he, she, or she has observed in real life. Okay, now, uh, this is the third question in this uh, webinar. Are there side hubs or platforms? What is the best option? Uh, are there side services can be delivered either in a hub environment or else through um, other side platforms. On the left, you can see a picture of me. I was uh, doing an assignment, it was short, and that's why I was working alone. And I was working in a hub environment with a technician's room being next to the booth, which was quite reassuring. Now, I would like to um, play a short video in order to depict what a hub environment looks like. And the purpose of showing this video is not at all to advertise this particular vendor, but to provide you with a practical example. All the same, I would like to thank all you say for having allowed me to share this material with you. Well, this is a hub that is located in downtown Madrid. They have 12 booths in place that they are working at of language combinations. The equipment is ISO compliant. There you can see the screen for video feed. The consoles provide all the functions and interfaces of traditional technical equipment in a conference setting. And this is the app that the audience would use to listen to the interpretation by entering an event code and a password. This is the technician's central console. You can see the technician working with multiple screens to control the video feed reaching the interpreter. This is an interpreter working through video feed. And then we have the rest of the facilities. Usually HABs uh, provide a rest area for interpreters to work or take breaks and also an area for refreshments. So all in all, we can say that it's a very pleasant and comfortable setting. Okay, so uh, what do we have on the other hand? On the other hand, we have all these players, Qdo, Interprefy, All You Say, Interaction, Voice Boxer, and the new kid on the block, that is Zoom. None of these other side platforms are fully compliant with ISO requirements, uh, re the ones recommended by AIC. We should say that they have been in place for quite some time and they uh, have been um, used uh, quite widely lately and they were 
already in use when COVID-19 broke out. Uh, the truth is that they were still going through a trial period and they were imperfect but sadly, they became the perfect solution. Um, I would say that other site platforms are not there yet. Eventually, they will be enhanced. But there's no denying that during COVID-19, they have helped bridge a gap and they have enabled many interpreters around the world to keep on working and earning an income, which is, of course, very important. Um, I would like to now um, give you a flavor of the look and feel of one of these uh, platforms. Let's see if the link works because even though it may seem rather easy from your side, but here I'm juggling a lot of balls, speaking about juggling many balls at the same time. Okay, here I will um, join a meeting. This is the gateway to this platform. Let's see why it doesn't work. Sorry about that. I will try again. Oops, keeps. If you would just bear with me a little bit, because I think that this is very important for you to see. And believe it or not, I have actually rehearsed this a thousand times, but Zoom is not always as friendly as it should. This is a common problem with Zoom. <laughs> um, I'm really sorry. I will, I will have to, um, I'm really sorry about that because actually it was working just fine a few minutes ago. And I have this specially prepared for you, so. Okay. Um, I will try to show it later, okay, because I don't want to waste uh, too much time now on this. But I think if you would bear with me a few minutes, Marjorie, because I think that this is very important to, to show and display. Take your time, stop. Silvana. Do what you I need will, to do. I will uh, stop sharing the function now just for one minute and I will Because this platform is uh, something that I'm sure that many of you would like to take a look at. I mean, it's just like many others, of course, in the market. Okay, there we go. You can still see anything, right? Uh, We see you, Solana. Yeah. You, you can see me, screen. okay. Now it's it's kind of strange that the link is not working now because actually it was. We did test it right before the presentation, I know. We test it right after the presentation, before the presentation, sorry. No, uh, something seems not to be working. I'm so, so sorry because so, I mean, right. that there's was plenty more. There's plenty more to share. So no, yes, there is plenty of more. But uh, actually, this was something because this is a platform that uh, shows a real artist side platform as the ones that we are normally using, at least here in Spain. Well, I will try to. If we have any time left afterwards, I will try to uh, show it to you. Okay, because it's uh, it's very interesting. Sounds like okay. a good plan. So uh, we said that we can provide other side services either through 
hubs or is through RSI platforms. Uh, what's the difference between the two? Basically, a hub is a controlled environment. That is, it replicates virtually all the functions and characteristics that you would normally have in a traditional conference setting. Basically, the characteristics are the following. Interpreters are co-located, the technician is on site, it ensures the quality and continuity of the data collection, it safeguards the confidentiality of all communications, provides a private and soundproofed setting, also consoles and interpreter interfaces, and ensures that the interpreter has access to conference documents that the interpreter can see just uh, the same as the audience. By contrast, RSI platforms do not allow for interpreters co-location. Some platforms provide remote technical support. Uh, that is to say the technician is located away from you. Connectivity problems may arise. Your connection may not be safe. Uh, you must create the right setting at home in order to provide other science services, which is not always possible because not everybody can allocate the uh, space needed for this. You work with a PC, and no matter how cutting edge your PC may be, it will never be the same as the traditional interpreter's equipment. Then the handover difficulty. This means switching turns. Even though most other side vendors claim that they support a handover feature. The truth is that in real life, um, they hardly work or they do not work as smoothly as they should. On the other hand, we also have relay restrictions. Even though these platforms also claim to support several language combinations, the truth is that when you have to work um, using relay features, the system does not uh, work smoothly either. Power may go out, this can happen. An interpreter is in charge of all technical aspects because as I mentioned before, you have to be acquainted with all the features provided by each platform. Okay, this is a real life uh, example. This is an event that was organized in New York last year. We were two interpreters uh, working remotely from a hub in Madrid. Um, we were interpreting remotely while the audience was listening to us through an app on their cell phones and we were watching this beautiful gala through our screens. It was all very exciting, but it was also very challenging too because this is an event that acknowledges the work of some distinguished uh, so social players. And on this particular occasion, there were several members of the Kennedy family, Luther King's daughter, Mandela's grandson, among others, who were the award winners of this edition and who delivered their speeches. So we had a lot on our plate. But the most challenging part was that this event was taking place at 8 p.m. New York time, that is 2 a.m. in the morning in Madrid. Uh, let me make an aside here because even if you sleep all day long to get ready for an assignment so early or so late, it all depends on the eye of the beholder, of course, uh, your body is not just at its best uh, at that time of the day. And maybe some of you may think that RSI is wonderful because it will now open a whole a lot of new work opportunities and will enable interpreters to serve clients all over the world, no matter the time zone difference. But the time zone difference does matter, and in, in fact, it can actually have a toll on your delivery. So you must really pay attention to that. Okay. Now I have some real life examples. Uh, for those of you who perhaps have never seen how, what type of events uh, could be um, done through RSI platforms. Here I have brought you two examples of assignments that an RSI interpreter could be requested to perform. So let's uh, play this first video. This is an interview, sorry, this is a speech delivered by Sir Ken Robinson. Um, Silvana, 
Uh, yes. We, uh, are you aware that your screen is not sharing? No, sorry. I, I thought that you, you didn't see everything that I was showing before. Earlier, yes, but then uh, not, not uh, in the last few minutes. I'm so sorry about no, that. No, that's... Well, this is incredible because we are doing a Zoom presentation and Zoom doesn't seem to be working. There okay. we go. Now you're screen sharing. And by the way, if you have further problems with links and you email them to uh, any of us at CCC, we, we might be able to get them up and running. For okay. you. But hopefully so that you won't have any that... more problems. <laughs> so that means that you didn't see this, right? Correct. Okay, so this was the gala I was talking about before. Um, these were the characteristics, but all, all the same, you will have this presentation later, so don't worry, okay? Okay, so back to, sorry about that, back to these, uh, to these examples. I moved to America 12 years ago uh, with my wife, Terry, and our two kids. Actually, truthfully, we moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> thinking we were moving to America, but anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a short plane ride from Los Angeles <laughs> to America. Um. Well, this is Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, I will cut the video here. In addition to having been made uh, Knight Bachelor by the Queen of England, we can say that uh, he is the interpreter's dream speaker. He has perfect diction, a well-structured speech. Uh, he ha uses his body language very effectively, the, not the right rhythm, etc. The only problem with these kind of speakers is that you are likely to encounter them once in your lifetime or perhaps twice if you get really lucky. Okay. But all in all, he would be the ideal speaker to interpret over another side platform. On the right hand side, we have another example, which is similar. It was November 1st, 2002, my first day as a principal, but hardly my first day in the school district of Philadelphia. Again, this uh, speaker is a little bit more emotional, but afterwards you will uh, be able to hear the whole video and she would be very nice to interpret too. Now, it's Zoom time and now we're going to um, get a little bit more realistic. This is the typical setting that uh, artists and interpreters have been exposed to mainly in the past two or three months. Let's play the first video. Thank you. Um, I guess we have a pretty exciting guest to introduce. Um, on the other side of the country, let's bring in Bill Gates. Bill, they say the, um, the uh, better known people are, the less you have to intro them. So <laughs> it's great to have you here. How, how are you doing? Well, I think this is a unprecedented, really disconcerting time for everyone uh, with things being shut down not knowing exactly how long it's going to last, worrying about the health of all the people we care about. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm lucky that I get to connect up with uh, video conferencing using Teams a lot. So Okay, uh, this is a very good example of two speakers holding a meeting over Zoom who provide a very good audio and video uh, input for the interpreter. So it couldn't be a problem at all to render a good service in this case. By contrast, we have, by contrast with Bill Gates, we have this other presentation or interview with uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley. Dr. Seth Berkeley is a well-known researcher in the field of Ebola and uh, coronavirus in the United States. All right, so talk about this virus, Seth. How is it different from Ebola how challenging is it to create a vaccine for it? So what's interesting about coronaviruses is, is that they are animal viruses, probably primarily in bats. They jump into other animals sometimes, and then they jump into humans. So this is, shouldn't have been a surprise. This is the third coronavirus that, is, um, that has jumped into human. We had SARS in early 2000. Two, we had mares, uh, you know, a number of years later, and, and now we have uh, this virus. What's interesting is there is a database that shows there are 30,000 some odd isolated coronaviruses in animals, 
And one of the things that people try to do is say the way these coronaviruses work is they have a spike on them. They're called corona because they look like the sun. That spike is where it attaches to a certain receptor in people's lungs. And so somebody said, well, maybe we can begin to look at those spikes and see if they're similar to the human receptors and maybe we can predict. But the problem is people don't invest in in those types of research. And okay. So by contrast with the previous video um, in which both speakers provided the route the right sound and image feed. In this case, we see that Chris Anderson's uh, sound quality continues to be very good. By contrast, Dr. Berkeley uh, seems to have a poor connection. We get a choppy sound. There's also plenty of echo in the background. Uh, there's a little bit of blaring in the image and above all, out of sync audio, which triggers off what we call latency problems or a lip latency. Why? Because there is a mismatch between the audio and the video or the audio lags behind the video or the other way around. This can be very confusing for the interpreter and in this case my tip of advice is to focus either on the video or on the audio feed. Um, I had to perform this uh, interview myself and uh, the truth is that unless you have certain experience doing confidence interpreting, dealing with so many problems uh, via Zoom can become quite a challenge. So you must be absolutely certain that if you take an assignment of this kind, you will be up to the task. At the bottom, you have another video which, uh, which further shows this lip latency problem that I have just described. Okay, now more on Zoom meetings. So here we have four examples which are absolutely uh, different from one another. And I hope that you can see the difference uh, between one and the other and draw your own conclusions. Today, there are over 7 billion people. And when those people come into the world, they demand more food, they demand a whole series of things and they live closer together. In fact, we're in an urban world where people live in urban areas. And at the same time, Okay, this is the typical uh, conference where you have some people attending on site, whereas you have a keynote speaker and other people connected via Zoom. However, all in all, the sound and the image uh, input is very good, so it shouldn't be a problem for the interpreter to have a good rendition working together forever and you really came together pretty aggressively with, with the Ebola crisis back in 2014. What does it feel like from your perspective? Pretty much uh, six years after the Ebola outbreak, we're really facing another crisis and we still pretty much like we never learned from the previous crisis. And that's really, for me, is heartbreaking. I think that, the, that this pandemic has shown us um, how unprepared that we are everywhere in the world. Chris okay, here we have three speakers, two of whom provide very good image and sound uh, input, whereas there is a third speaker whose uh, sound quality is not bad um, for a regular listener, but is not of sufficient quality for the interpreter. In fact, he seems to be speaking uh, from the backyard or from the garden in his house, uh, you can hear the birds singing at the back. Uh, and I'm sure that that is very relaxing for the speaker, but quite vexing for the interpreter. So this calls for urgent uh, client education or customer education. Why? Because uh, now that Zoom has become so popular and I believe that it will continue to be increasingly more used because of cost effectiveness reasons, we must make customers aware of the fact that they have to provide interpreters with the right working conditions as far as the platform allows. That is good sound and good image. Uh, therefore, the number one recommendation is that they should use headsets with built-in microphones. And here we have an example of that. In the next video, you will see four speakers.
in headsets with built-in microphones, whereas the other two are not. And I'm sure that you will be able to tell the difference. Hi, Rob Scott from UC Today, and welcome to today's panel discussion. Today, we'll be discussing Cisco WebEx versus Microsoft. Uh, a Cisco partner, um, largely focused though around the whole piece around di driving digital and workplace transformation uh, and the adoption uh, of the... Um... Sorry about that. Hi, Rob Scott from UC Today. Tom? All my time focused on Microsoft collaboration, so particularly Microsoft Teams. Uh, I also do... And zoom um our room systems for these solutions and um like that working at okay so the two guys using headsets with microphones uh, provide a much better sound fit for the interpreter so that's what we should ask for when accepting tasks over uh, other side platforms or also through zoom and finally we have the icing on the cake um, I'll go first. Um, okay. hey, my, name, my name is RJ Middleton. Uh, I'm at North Dakota High School in Stonewall, Louisiana. I'm the offensive coordinator for the football team. Um, I'm a leader. Quickly for us. Uh, the tab rubric is an instructional practices rubric, and we use it to coach uh, coach teachers in the, in the best practices instructionally, and hopefully that leads to student achievement and teacher uh, teach at Central High School. Um, it started about 10 years ago. It's an offshoot of the EBR, the East Baton Rouge. They started their own, own school. Uh, I'm a health science department head there. This is my fifth year. Um, Okay, so this is what I would call the nightmare scenario. It couldn't be any worse. We have multiple speakers, none of them using uh, headsets with built-in microphones. They are speaking or attending this meeting from poorly lit rooms with plenty of background noise. There seems to be a TV on. There is this lady who seems to be lying in bed, another one holding her baby. Now, believe it or not, you do get the situations when doing Zoom meetings. I mean, you can see the most awkward scenarios you can imagine and only again a full-fledged interpreter can cope with so many hindrances okay now important to remember when doing other side tasks um, you are most likely to be recorded for webcast or web, for web streaming purposes. You must be aware of that before you accept any task and you must be certain that you will be able to perform adequately. I recommend that a language disclaimer be included in any recorded material um, that is interpretation services rendered through video or audio channels uh, stating very clear that the interpretation should be considered for communication purposes only and not as an authentic record of the event. And uh, finally, we have this concept called latency that we have already depicted with Dr. Um, Seth Berkeley's video. Um, when we saw that mismatch between the audio and the video. Well, um, the audio and the video should reach the interpreter's headsets and screen within 500 milliseconds. Also on another side platforms, which is usually not the case. Whereas a latency between the original speech and reception of the interpretation by the audience should be within 1000 milliseconds. So these are some technical requirements that uh, you should bear in mind. This is an article that was published on the New York Times. It was very interesting and explains why Zoom is so exhausting. And it refers to some of those artifacts that we saw in the previous um, videos, such as blocking, freezing, blurry, jerkiness, and out of sync audio, all of which increases the interpreter's cognitive load. So I encourage you to take a look at this uh, article if you get the chance. Next question, this is question number four, what type of communicative events are most suitable for RSI? Business meetings, business presentations, involving 
not too many people, of course. Company meetings, interviews, uh, like the ones with uh, Bill Gates, keynote lectures, presentations on financial results. This is customary in Europe, particularly in Spain. And corporate meetings, for example, the CEO of a company sending a message on COVID-19 to all employees around the globe. But we are talking about not many people being involved in the event. However, However, RSI is not suitable for long meetings nor for conferences beyond three hours. Please bear that in mind. And they are not suitable for such meetings, not only for um, the interpreter's sake, but also for the participants' sake. Okay, and now we come to the last question. How do I train my brain to get started in RSI? For those of you who have not gone through formal training, well, of course, my first tip of advice would be that you enroll in a formal program or in a formal interpreter's uh, training uh, program. Uh, however, if you want to get started and you want to, well, get a flavor of what RSI might be, and um, you want to get your brain sort of warmed up, perhaps you could like to take a look at all these exercises that I have listed here. Scan and reading, this is about taking a quick look at the text in order to identify the most important pieces of information. Paraphrasing means um, doing an exercise to increase your lexical fluency and find lexical equivalence. Side translation is my favorite exercise. It's commonplace in interpreter schools. It's about moving from written to spoken text. This is about rendering a written text more communicative or what we call oralizing the text. Very practical exercise. Memorizing and reformulating. Well, this is a, about memorizing a text and trying to distinguish between primary and secondary information and then reproduce the text either in the source language or in the target language. Close. This is one of my favorites as well. This is about deleting connectors, keywords, work groups for the trainee to fill in the gaps. And afterwards, I'm going to show you an example. This exercise is very good for intuition building. Keywords, well, this is about identifying the main constituents of the text and try to grasp the main uh, concepts. And summarizing is about uh, trying to speed up the identification of the basic units of an audio, video, or written text also to learn to select important information as opposed to secondary information. This is an example of a closed exercise. So if you are a trainee and you want to get your brain warmed up, you can try something like this. This is an excerpt from um, Sir um, Ken Robinson's uh, speech. I have deleted some of the words, the main words he uses. And the trainee in this case would have to fill in the gaps. In order to come up with something that makes sense at the end, you would have to read ahead two or three words before you fill in each gap. And at the end, you should come up with something like this. Again, very useful exercise to get your brain going. This is an example of summarizing. On the left, you see an excerpt of Seth Berkeley's presentation, and on the right hand side, you can see a summary. Very practical, too. And finally, we have TED Talks. I know that this may sound pretty basic to some of you or self evident, but believe me, TED Talks are a wonderful source of material for interpreting practice that we all have at our fingertips. Why? Well, because they uh, have two features that I like quite a lot TED transcripts that you can print by following all these steps, or TED subtitles that you can load by following these uh, steps. Uh, let me take a quick look at this. Let's see if now this video works uh, for those of you who are not acquainted with this feature. Just to let you know, Silvana, you do have a lot of questions. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm almost there. Okay, I'm almost there. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, so this is the typical, can you see me uh, okay, uh, Marjorie? Can you, can you confirm that you can see the screen that I'm sharing right now with Ken Robinson? No, uh, we're, we're seeing a Word document with uh, the two links. I would suggest okay. we, we move to Q&A because there's a lot of really good questions. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Just let me, let me finish with this because this is, this is about it, okay? This is um, I'm almost there. There we go. Okay. Now you can see, right? We can see um, okay. the video. Yes. Okay, great. Well, just, just uh, two words. Here you can see um, this video that we saw before. This is the function for subtitles. And this is the function about transcripts. This is a pop-down menu that you can display. And there you have all the transcripts in the different languages available. You can download these transcripts and do that first side exercise that I showed before. And then you can compare your rendering. You record yourself and you can compare your own rendering with the transcript or else with the subtitles. Okay, and that's all. Uh, I hope I have attained my goal of answering these uh, five key questions within this uh, short time. I'm sorry I couldn't show you the platform because actually that was a beautiful part of the presentation. And But I hope that I have been able to shed some light on RSI and above all I hope that this new work environment will bring about many work opportunities for all interpreters around the globe. So thank you. And that's all Marjorie, ready for the questions. Well, uh, it's I who thank you, and um, we, we certainly have a boatload. If you'll be kind enough to, to make me host again while I uh, start sharing uh, the questions. Um, hold on. Um, yes. We had two questions. Are you ready, uh, Silvada? Uh, yes. We had two questions about the research you mentioned very early in the presentation. Uh, indicating that the cognitive load uh, in, is some 25% greater in distance interpreting and someone else is actually asking for the citation about additional stress caused by RSI. So this, this came early. Okay, well, yes, in fact, uh, the, I believe that the explanation is uh, given especially in that article in the New York Times that I showed you before. Uh, you have to deal with so many features. Again, the technical variables on the one hand, and also the fact that you are not, uh, in most cases, working with a partner. Again, I'm talking about RSI services delivered over platforms, not in a hub situation, because in a hub situation, you are co-located with your partner, so it's the same as a booth situation. But when you are away from your partner, the fact of being on your own, the fact of not having anybody backing you up, giving you help with jotting down a, a word or a number, that's the reason why it increases the cognitive load because you have to uh, enhance your concentration in order to be able to cope with so many situations that are, until now have not been commonplace for interpreters. Thank you. Um, did you, you mentioned methods uh, suggested to manage stress and fatigue in RSI. Um, what, what are those methods is the question. No, actually, I didn't mention any methods. Actually, oh, then I'm misinterpreting uh, the question. I apologize. No, no, no. Actually, what I said is that even for a uh, highly experienced confidence interpreter dealing with RSI over platforms is a challenge. But in my humble opinion, confidence interpreters are better off because uh. we have a lot of experience uh, dealing or experience that we have built over the years and we have the expertise the between language control, the executive control and the metalinguistic ability that I explained. Something that you have to develop and that's why training is so important. Got it. Thank you. Now, in this pandemic time, someone else asks, is everyone, including the technicians working from home? And what happens if there are technical glitches? Okay. Well, in the case of RSI platforms, some platforms, uh, well, 
except for Zoom, uh, all of the rest do provide technical support. Yes, there is a technician working from home, but that technician can be in Croatia or can be in Greece while you're working perhaps in Honduras. So uh, somehow um, you don't feel very reassured working uh, in those conditions. And if technical glitches arise, that's a very good question. The technician is supposed to be able to solve them. But if you're working on your own, and if you have a problem with the video feed or the audio feed, you have to add yet another task to what you are doing at that moment that is interpreting, and you would have to write a chat to the technician saying that you are having a technical problem. So again, that also adds to the cognitive load that we mentioned before. It sure sounds like it. Um, someone, uh, more than one person wants to know the specs of your uh, Sennheiser headset. <laughs> Okay, well, I can send them to you uh, afterwards oh, if you want. But all the great. same, it's Sennheiser USB-C 160. Uh, I love this microphone. These are, um, this is the headset that I normally use for RSI assignments, and they work very well. Thank you, thank you. Um, how can we ask for help in RSI when the other colleague is in a different location? Is Chatbox the only tool available? Is the only tool available or else you can WhatsApp your colleague, which is more or less the same. Um, again, it does not come out naturally uh, when you are interpreting and you are using uh, a small screen, which I don't recommend. I recommend that you do RSI with a big screen uh, to at least not to cause too much strain on your eyes because that can be very tiring at the end and it goes against your health. So uh, there's no option. I mean, you just send a chat via the platform or through via WhatsApp. That's it. Um, thank you. Um, what is the frequency and impedance recommended for headsets generally? I just bought a Sennheiser PC8 UBS, but it seems there's a more recent model. Now I use Bang Olufsen's, Olufsen earphones. Wow, that's a very technical question that I don't think I will be able to answer. But Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not such a technical per expert. But if you go to the slide that I showed you with IX uh, table, the one that IX um, provided by way of recommendation, uh, there, and if you take a look into each of those models on the internet. I'm sure that they will provide you with further details on impedance and all other specs. Excellent. Thank you. Um, would they be suitable for police interviews is the question. And I think the questioner means would RSI platforms be suitable for police interviews? Uh, I think so, provided that you are absolutely sure about um, having the right security levels. The problem here is that if you are working uh, from home, you need to make sure that you have a safe connection, that you have the right viruses, antiviruses, sorry, not viruses, the, the right antiviruses in place. Um, but it shouldn't be a problem. Actually, I have been doing plenty of highly confidential meetings over Zoom. You know that at the beginning there was a claim that Zoom was not uh, safe and secure enough. Then security patches were added to render Zoom more secure. And now most of my clients in the private sector, at least in, in Spain, are using uh, Zoom for uh, confidential meetings. So um, if you are asking whether this would be safe from a security perspective, fr from the rather from an information security perspective, I would say yes. Uh, thanks. And just to our listeners, there is going to be our next webinar two weeks from today is mm -hmm. focused on legal um, uh, RSI specifically um, from a U.S. perspective, mind you. Um, 
someone asked, could you talk a little bit more about the disclaimer? Um, the disclaimer was the IEC disclaimer. Um, yes, well, no, actually that's a recommendation that IEC uh, makes. Mm -hmm. And I, believe, I, I truly agree with that. You know that according to uh, regulations on pro intellectual property rights, uh, prior written consent by the interpreter is required before recording any interpretation services. Uh, that that to begin with and it, when especially in Europe there's a lot of webcasting and web streaming lately and sometimes we interpreters are being recorded without being informed ahead of time which actually breaches property uh, intellectual property rights so you if you you always have to ask before accepting a task whether you will be recorded and if that is the case you should ask for this disclaimer to be added again stating that the um, interpretation that is being recorded or that is being done through these video and audio channels has only the purpose of facilitating communications, but it's not actually intended to be an authentic record of the event because anything can happen and you have to, you know, protect yourself. If you have a technical glitch, but you are a good interpreter and you decide not to stop the service and, good, uh, and go on, you have to make certain that at the end, nobody is going to complain. Customers must be aware that the output is as good as the input. Mm -hmm. and you should bear that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this, I don't know if you want to comment, but the question is what platform would you say does the job best? <laughs> well, uh, no, I can't comment on that because I would be advertising <laughs> a particular vendor. Actually, uh, I'm so sorry I couldn't show you this platform uh, because um, this platform, the beauty of this platform is that it provides a console that replicates the numerical keyboard on our PC keyboards. So all the functions that you would normally have in um, a traditional console in an interpreter's booth, uh, you will find those functions in this keyboard. So it's very comfortable, it's very handy uh, to use, but again, uh, I cannot recommend any platform. I, the, the only thing I can say is that so far, None of them works perfectly well, and they still need to be enhanced, technically speaking, in order to be absolutely interpreter friendly and in order to comply with IEX recommendations. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, this would be our last question. How many speakers would you say is a good maximum, like in Zoom meetings, we saw how many attendees there were in that educational meeting. What, do you have a maximum? <laughs> There's no problem with the number, actually, provided that you have a good host or a good moderator that will know when to mute and unmute the microphones and will make sure that all the people attending the meeting are using the right headsets, they are in the right uh, setting, and they speak one at a time. That's it. I mean, of course, um, they, if you don't have a crowded audience, so much better. But it's not a problem if the host does his or her job and if people are aware that a Zoom meeting poses a much greater challenge to the interpreter. Well, thank you, Silvana. Um, if you would be, uh, before I go any further, before I forget, would you be kind enough to um, click beside my name and make, and, and make me host? You well, can. I did that already, Marjorie, but for some reason it didn't it work. Just, it didn't take. Uh, it doesn't work. Let's try Okay, again. there you go. I am now the host. Thank you so much. Okay, you're very um, welcome. And without uh, further ado, that was an amazing presentation. Um, one participant wrote that it was chock full of valuable information. We had um, well um, over 900 participants, as you saw, attending and uh, many of them uh, wrote some heartfelt thanks for the presentation. We're extraordinarily lucky, lucky to have, have had you. Thank you for everything you did and all the amazing 
rich information you shared with us. My pleasure, Marjorie. And of course, uh, I will be sending you the presentation to distribute with all the attendees. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, it was, I was really delighted to spend these 45 minutes with you. And, and those questions and answers. Thank you indeed.